Okay, let's plop her downstream here a little ways. See if we can lay it in there nice and light and get a good drag-free float. That's what it's all about. Okay. Oh, that's looking good. There's one, yeah, yeah. Yo, jumping trout, jumping trout. <laughs> I, even though he's a brown, he went airborne. Love it when I brown and jump. Okay. Okay, you bugger. All right. Pretty little brown. Oh, well, hey. You can do everything right, get them up to your rod tip, and they'll still come off. Son of a gun. Ah, flies okay. Points all right, nothing broken. Just came off. Bad angle, let's do it again. Do it again. Let's see if we can make it float good. Nice high cast. Lay it in light, one's looking. There, ooh, boy. Woo, that was a better fish. Better fish. Get back out there again. See what's shaking. Come on, baby. What's shaking, what's shaking? Breakfast time, breakfast time. Making them nervous. Oh, let's go back and try that again. Oh, that's a good spot. Yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. Okay, baby. Yeah. Oh, I love these little boys. Take it off. Take it off. That's a trap. That's a good trap. That's probably the best one I've hooked for this one. Oh my golly, it is a boat. Daddy. <laughs> Full tight like a boat. Yeah, right? That's what you have to get at here, huh? Get it upstream. Get the fingers on the belly. Love it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Super fish. Great way to start the morning. Love it, love it. This tape will integrate all of Doug Swisher's unique casting concepts and techniques. All of the mental and physical skills that are necessary for you to hook selective trout and become the complete fly fisherman. Hi, I'm Doug Swisher. In our basic and advanced casting tapes, you learn how to control the cast with your educated wrist and how to deliver proper presentation cast from any angle. Now I'll teach you how to develop effective strategies by combining the thought process with these physical skills. I'll show you what to do when the fish are rising and what to do when they're not rising. For those non-hatch periods, when there's no apparent surface activity, I'll teach you how to read the water so you'll know where to cast your fly to have the best possible chance of catching a fish. I'll demonstrate how to cover these hot spots effectively with nymphs, streamers, dry fly attractors, and terrestrials. When the fish are up feeding on top, I'll show you how to select the right fly and make the right presentation. I'll also take you through a typical mayfly hatch situation from bottom to top. First, let's talk about the efficiency factor of fishing. There's a big difference between fishing and just casting. When you're fishing, every motion is accomplishing something. There's no wasted movements. Pretend there's a drag-free timer on the bank, and you only get ticks on it when the right fly is in the right place and is acting in a natural manner. Many anglers get very few ticks on the timer. Here are some reasons why. Most fishermen are much too slow at changing flies and adding tippets. There are two main reasons. First, they simply can't see well enough to tie the knots. This can easily be solved with magnifiers. Secondly, they are not proficient at tying knots. You must practice until you can tie them quickly. 30 seconds should be maximum for changing flies. 
the vest plays a very important role in your overall efficiency. You've got to have the right tools and you've got to have them in the right place. Let me show you some of the tools that I have in my vest and tell you why I use them. First of all, I carry hook cones, obviously to keep those points sharp. Secondly, I carry a thermometer. I check the temperature when I go fishing so I know if I'm going to find those optimum conditions for feeding trout. Carry the long nose. These little guys are not serrated on the inside, they're flats, so if I can break off the barbs on hooks. I carry these hemostats. In case I've hooked the fish deeply, it's much easier than trying to use your fingers. This, I think, is a very important item to carry, the streamside scissors. Quite often, I'm out there fishing. I've got a fly that's too bushy. The wings are too long. I can use the scissors to get it to the right size. Now, I've saved the three most important to last. This is one you may not have thought of before. It's a little monocular, and I use that for looking up and down the stream, for observing the aquatic insects when they're hatching and drifting along. Quite often, from a very long distance, you can see exactly what the hatch is. And the two most important of all, which I recommend strongly that you carry, are the seine and the stomach pump. You use the seine for collecting the bugs as they float on the top or get them out from underneath the rocks. And use a stomach pump if you've caught a fish. It just takes a second to find out what he's been eating. Two very important tools. <clears throat> so you've got to have the right tools, put them in the right place so they're handy. Speaking of being handy, there's four items that you use all day long, time after time after time. The first, of course, are your flies. I carry two boxes loaded with flies, got them all lined up like little soldiers so they're very easy to see, handy to get to. I keep those boxes right up front, one on each side, so I can get to them very quickly. The second item are your clippers, being right-handed, I find it's most efficient to have them here. And the other two items that are extremely important are your tippets and your floating. These four items are used all day long, and I keep them right here in this little magic circle. So a tip on loading your vest. Don't put it up on a coat hanger and load it from that position. Put it on empty, and then you get everything in the right spot. Load that vest properly, and you'll have a great filing system for keeping track of everything in the stream. It'll make you more efficient. Many anglers false cast too much. After all, the fish can't get your fly if it's in the air. They only care about your delivery cast, not your false cast. So false cast just enough to dry your fly and change direction. If you have the ability to put your fly in the right spot on the first cast, you will accumulate a lot more effective fishing time at day's end. The angler that presents his fly properly has a greater chance of catching fish than the angler with poor presentation. Taking the average number of casts per hour times the average length of natural drift, an efficient angler with good presentation can end up with as much as an extra mile of drag-free float at the end of the day. Just think how many extra fish you can get with that extra mile. There are two basic conditions that exist on a stream. A hatch, when the fish are rising, or no hatch, when the fish aren't rising. Let's take a common sense approach to look at what you should do in each situation. Let's face it, most of the time, even on the best of streams, the fish are not in a feeding frenzy. During these times of no surface feeding, the fish are wary and very skittish. There is a relationship between food and fear that is important to the angler. The greater the amount of food in the water, the less the fear displayed by the fish. Their main concern is grabbing an easy meal. You can wait extremely close and they'll normally keep right on feeding. But as soon as the hatch is over and the surface food has disappeared, the fish become wary again. So when there's no hatch, 
for surface activity that would show us exactly where the fish are, you must be able to determine where they are, or at least where they should be. Don't waste your time fishing where there's a low probability of success. In many of the big western rivers, no more than 10% of the water holds trout. So the challenge is to recognize and avoid the 90% or the unproductive water. You must have guidelines to tell you where the trout should be under normal conditions. Gain experience by learning your own water well. Then when you go to strange water, you'll recognize similar situations. Requirements are the same in all rivers. Trout must have shelter and a good food supply. The reason for shelter is twofold. They need protection from their enemies and from the energy robbing currents. The reason for a good food supply is rather obvious. A trout burns up a lot of energy trying to survive in the currents of a stream. Trout establish preferred positions or stations in the stream. These special places are called lies and are selected because of the quantity of food available or the shelter provided or both. The best way to spot lies is to study currents. Watch for the places where currents funnel food into a natural feeding lane and especially where fast water meets slow water. Areas where these currents of varying speeds come together are called seams. Let me give you a basic demo of what a seam is. For this demo, I'm going to be the obstruction here in the river. Now, where I'm standing, I have a current coming into my waders. Where that current hits my waders, it speeds up and goes faster. Let me show you that. I'll dump a few of these little flowers in. But you can see that they're going to go right on by me very quickly. Now, the current behind me is rather dead water. Let me show you how slow that's moving. See these flowers? They, in fact, they even jumped in behind me here, but they're staying relatively motionless. The point is where that fast water meets the slow water is what we call a seam, and trout love it. They love to lay slightly into the slow water, but close enough to the fast water so they can grab an easy meal. Okay, now here's a neat little trick where you can use your fly line to identify seams. Take your line and throw it straight across the current where you think there might be a seam and watch the line very carefully and see what happens. In that instance, very little happened. It stayed relatively straight. But when I throw it up here, see what happens immediately? It jumps into a series of curly cues and sine waves and that indicates that you have lots of currents of different velocities and that's what I call a great seam setup. So learn to read seams, you'll know where the trout are. There are many places for trout to lie in this water. However, the most likely places will be the seams, where the fast water meets the slow water. These areas will hold the best fish, and this is where you should concentrate your efforts. Of course, seams aren't the only areas in a stream that hold trout, but they're generally a good place to try, especially when there's little surface activity. Also, look for places where shallow water drops to deep and where the water changes color from light to dark. When the hatch is either very sparse or non-existent and there are no steady risers, you must be creative to be successful on a consistent basis. To be creative, you must know and practice a variety of searching techniques, both on the surface and beneath the surface. So let's start with some underwater techniques. Even though trout are not feeding on top, that doesn't mean they're not feeding down below. In fact, trout feed almost non-stop. They're constantly picking something out of the current and occasionally right off the bottom. Be sure to wear Polaroids on bright days and by focusing on the bottom, not on the surface, you will quickly learn to detect any movement. Be alert for the visual keys or signs, the underwater swirls and flashes that are a tip-off that trout are actively feeding beneath the surface. If you use a small seine like this one, it just takes a few minutes to check out the population of the stream bottom 
and the nymphal types. You'll get a good cross section by checking the ripples, deeper runs, backwaters, vegetation, and under big rocks and logs. Let's look at some of the nymphs you can expect to find and some of the patterns that imitate them. Mayfly nymphs have six legs and two or three tails. They are normally found in sizes eight through 20. My favorite nymphal pattern has a fur body and a quill wing case. The most popular colors are brown, tan, and olive. Stonefly nymphs have everything in pairs. Two tails, two antenna, two wing pads, and two claws in each foot. They are normally found in sizes ranging from a large two down to the smaller twelves. My favorite stonefly nymphs are the Little Black Stone and George's Brown Stone. Caddisflies have two immature stages. First, there's the larva or caddis worm. The larva changes into the pupal stage. Both larva and pupa are generally found in sizes 12 down to size 18. My favorite larva imitation is the green caddis worm. My choice for the pupa is the green caddis pupa. Imitate the mature nymphs. The ones with the dark wing cases, not the immature translucent ones. The mature nymphs will usually be most abundant. Use size, shape, and color to match your artificial to the naturals. I find that impressionistic flies are better than realistic patterns for this type of non-hatch fishing. This is a realistic pattern of a stonefly nymph. Notice how much it looks like the real thing. But when it gets wet, it doesn't come to life and fish tend to reject hard body flies very quickly. Flies such as the hare's ear and the partridge caddis are excellent examples of time-proven impressionistic flies. I think it's very important that imitations have soft hackles and fuzzy bodies. They look more natural when they're wet and have built-in movement. They also give more hookups since they feel natural to the trout. Seining gives you an extra measure of confidence. By knowing that you're imitating what the trout are likely feeding on, you will fish much more effectively. For my nymph and wet fly fishing, I use a number five weight, eight and a half foot long graphite two fly rod. I like the graphite two because it's so light and it has such great action. I can cast all day without getting tired and its smooth progressive action allows me to control my loop both in the air and on the water. For a reel, I just use a lightweight single action fly reel, cranking on the left side. For a fly line, I like the bright colors. The visibility establishes that mental confidence factor that you need for this kind of fishing. So now let me show you some of the methods that I use to fish nymphs and wet flies near the bottom. If the water is not deep, only a foot or so, and the current is not too fast, I use a fly tied on a heavy hook or a lightly weighted fly, tied to a long fine leader, 10 to 12 feet, and tapered down to five or six X. In the beginning, it may help to have an indicator in your system so you can detect strikes easier. Okay, now I'm gonna show you how to fish nymphs in shallow, slow-moving water, basically in the upstream quadrant, from 10.30 to 1.30 on the clock. For this demonstration, I'll quarter upstream. And it's basically straight line casting. You can put a little slack into it if you've got tricky currents, but in even ones here, I throw basically straight I immediately apply the control system and take in the slack and I have total concentration on the indicator and the leader system. Throw it up at about 45 degrees, use your control, line over the finger, go with the flow, take in the slack and the object of course is to keep that line as straight as you can keep it but without dragging the fly. Now, after you've done some of this nymphing, you won't have to use the little indicator. I just use a high-vis leader for most of my fishing. Now, if I throw there a little further, 
the fly is being held up a little more than in than this even current here so I can use a little mend just flick a little bit of line upstream but I still have total concentration on the indicator and leader system now I go with the flow and if I do get a strike down in this area just pick the rod up gently don't snap it out of the water or you'll break off if you get a strike up in here, any pause at all in that system, just lift the rod quickly but firmly. Okay, we're going to do a little uh, upstream nymphing here. Kind of a narrow stream. Got to watch your back cast and your front cast, matter of fact, got all this overhanging foliage here. So I'm going to keep my cast low, zip a straight line right up in the old 12 o'clock position. You basically use the control system. Just throw it upstream, keep your eye on that bright colored line, line over the finger. When something moves that line, come up with a rod. Now with this fast water, it takes a lot of work, a lot of casting and recasting, but it's the only way to cover it effectively. Right straight upstream, keep your eye on that bright orange line. Get that cast right over the, there's one, there's one, okay. And he sucked it up with just a little bit below the current. No, not a bad fish. A little bit of jump in there. Okay. Now, in this fast water, you got to be careful that he doesn't get down below you. But if he does, just go down with him. Don't put too much pressure. You break off. Okay. He took that little hair's ear right about six inches below the film. And I saw the line hesitate for a second, and I just picked it up. Not real hard just be kind of quick not too difficult oh nice whoa he's not ready yet he said hey i don't want to come in there pretty fish pretty fish yeah okay oh bye bye okay now get that nymph keep it wet but you want to be careful in the casting that you don't dry it out too much and i have to zip a fairly tight loop here I don't overdo it because I don't want to dry that nymph out. And the object is to strip fast enough to keep the system tight, but not too fast so that you drag the fly. I guess one of the real keys here is just being very observant. Look for flashes and swirls. Sometimes they'll hit it so gentle that you don't see much moving with your line and leader system. And you'll just detect the strike by seeing some movement. That's why it pays to wear your Polaroids, especially on a bright day. Ah, we can get up above that rock. Should be one land. Some, ooh, boy, oh boy, oh boy. Woof. Now, I was a little slow there. He was, he was on it. I probably came up a little bit slow, although it might have been just a poor hooking angle. Try it again. Gotta watch you on that line. There we go. Oh, oh, oh we. <laughs> Ah, well, we pulled him out of the water, and he did a number on me. He put me right up in the old tree. Okay. But better to have had him on than not to have had him on, I always say. Yeah, maybe we'll get it out after all. Yeah, there we go. All right. Well, that was worth it. That was worth it. You can't complain. You sure don't land them all in this game. For nymphing in deeper water like this, I use a variety of weight systems ahead of the fly. First of all, I like to use a fly that's unweighted. I get a better natural drift. I'm less likely to snag the bottom. For a weight system, I use either split shot or copper sleeves. Lead goes on easy, but also comes off easy and is hard to cast. Copper sleeves are harder to put on, but being tubular, they never come off. They allow much smoother casting, hardly ever snag the bottom, and are reusable. Now let's go even deeper. To fish even deeper water, four feet or more, sinking lines can be deadly. My favorite for most stream situations is the wet tip, high speed, high density. The super fast sink rate of the tip will take your fly down like a rock, while the lighter colored floating line will allow you to mend and manipulate your line with ease. With a wet tip line, you would normally use a very short leader, only two to four feet long. This helps to keep the fly near the bottom. The wet tip shoots well, and the floating portion is easy to handle 
after the cast is made. Sometimes if I have to go really deep in heavy currents or deep pools or down to the depth of 10 to 15 feet in a lake, I use the wet tip high speed high D with a long leader. With this line leader system, I add copper sleeves, sometimes a dozen or more, to a 10 to 12 foot leader. I start with groups of six in the heavy butt section and gradually reduce the size of the groups, five, four, three, two, and so forth, down towards the tippet. This combination casts smoothly and allows me to throw tight loops. The groups are separated by figure eight knots, which can easily be taken out when you want to remove the reusable sleeves. Hey, let me show you how, how to tie the figure eight knot. We'll use this rope to simulate your leader. First of all, make a loop by bringing the tag in under the main line. Make a second loop by bringing it over the main line. Now you see the figure eight and bring the tag in up through the first loop pull it up and you have a nice symmetrical knot. You can use that knot for separating your copper sleeves. When you're through fishing, you want to take the sleeves off your leader. The knot comes out very easy. Your leader will stay straight and you can reuse the sleeves. Here's an excellent little spot where I want to show you how I fish my weighted nymph system. It's really not deep enough to go in with the heavy duty stuff like the wet tips and heavy split shot. But I'm going to use my copper sleeve system. <clears throat> I have a progression of copper sleeves, three up a little higher, two down lower, and one just above the tippet knot. They're progressively reduced in mass so you get a nice smooth cast, yet it will take your fly down. I'm going to use this little dark hair's ear nymph to fish you this run. Now the reason I like to fish this type of a run is you've got broken water. Uh, this is the type of water at the head of the pool where a major percent of the species of nymphs live. And the fish know that, so they congregate in this type of an area, and it's a great spot for them to have cover and yet have their food coming right by. Okay, now I'll show you how I fish this run. I'll start by casting upstream at about the 10:30 position. Just a straight line cast. Then I use a control system, line over the finger, lower the rod. The main thing is to go with the flow so you get a nice natural drift in the nymph. Now let me throw that up there again. Straight line cast, immediately go into your control system. Now when you get down near the end of the float, that fly starts to escape. You can let it just drift around naturally. You can rise it, you can twitch it. There's a variety of ways to make that fly drift at the end, but be very alert for the strike. Let's do that one more time. We're gonna roll it right along the bottom. Oh, <laughs> I had a strike up there. Almost, <laughs> almost nailed it after it went a foot or two. He was looking for it. Okay, take it down, go with the flow. Okay, this time I'll rise it at the end of the drift, kind of like this. Hup, hey, got one. Now he hit it just as it started to rise. That's a time when they do like to hit it, they think it's gonna get away from them. Nice little fish. Not a real big fish, but took it just as it started to escape. Now that took a little while to get that weight system right to get to the bottom. That's what you've got to do. Get the weight right. Okay. Not a giant, but kind of a nice little brownie. Took it just as it started to come up. Hey, there we go. Okay. All right. Wet flies and nymphs are deadly if they are presented properly. The keys to this type of fishing are establishing the correct weighting system for the speed and depth of water you're fishing and applying the control system to help you get a natural drift. Now let's go on to another method of catching trout when they're not rising. Now that you know how to fish relatively small flies deep in the currents with a natural drift, I'll show you how to fish streamers with a moving, darting action. Small trout, minnows, leeches, and other large, yummy-looking creatures that inhabit a trout stream can be imitated with streamers. These flies are usually in the number four to number 10 size range. By and large, you'll catch bigger trout when you fish streamers. Large fish expend more energy chasing down their food, so they require a bigger reward. After all, 
a four inch minnow represents a lot more food value than a size 16 mayfly. Streamers even work well in a stream where there are very few minnows because their fast, escaping type movement creates excitement. In a stream where an abundance of minnows are present, try to match your artificial to the naturals using size, shape, and color as criteria, much like matching the hatch. A good rule to follow in color selection is to match the color of the stream bottom. Minnows blend with the coloration of the stream. This is Mother Nature's protective device. Streamers with built-in action are the most effective. Materials like fur, feathers, and yarn seem to come alive in the water. Marabou is especially good. The Matuka, the Woolly Bugger, and the Aztec are three of the deadliest modern day streamers and each has its own strong points. The Matuka style of streamer, which has its wing tied down over its body, gives a better imitation of a minnow than the old fashioned scissor wing style. It also reduces fouling. The Matuka has a great profile, but you have to provide the action. Fast tripping is usually best. The Woolly Bugger has the great build-in action of the marabou tail. It has what I call marabou magic. Woolly buggers are usually fish slower and deeper. The Aztec has a profile of the Matuka, but has better build-in action. The fine acrylic fibers not only have great action, but are extremely durable. The Aztec can be fished at any speed. Now I'm going to give you a basic demonstration of how to fish the Matuka streamer. The Matuka is one of my very favorite streamers of all. I think the main reason is it looks more like a little minnow or a little fish than any other type of streamer. That wing is lashed down in the top and it just holds a really nice silhouette. Now, you're going to fish this thing wet. So you might as well start out with it wet. Don't wait till you cast it and louse up your first cast. Get it wet, you can either put it in your lips like this get a little slive on it, or just take it down to the water, get it wet. <clears throat> but be sure you get her good and moist before you start fishing it. Now it's ready to go. Now another thing about fishing these bigger flies is that they have a lot more wind resistance. We've been used to throwing these little teeny dries back and forth and they move through the air very quickly. This guy's got a lot of resistance so we've got to slow down our casting stroke. Slow and easy. Give it time to straighten to the rear before you go forward. So we're going to use the Matuka, we're going to use it on a 9 to 12 foot leader, just a normal leader that I use for my dry fly fishing. And I'm going to use a 3x tippet. Sometimes I even go down to 4 or 5x. I keep that tippet fairly light, even with big streamers, so I get a better action in the water. Now let me show you how to fish it. This is a basic demonstration of not only how to fish the Matuka, but any streamer. You start with a straight line cast. The reason you want the line straight is to cover maximum distance, and on the first trip you're moving the fly. After the line starts to flow downstream, you start stripping, line over the finger. Notice how I rotate with the system as it goes downstream. Make a straight line cast, control system, line over the finger, rotate downstream as you're stripping, and you try to keep that line coming across the currents so you cover more fish. Now, when that streamer gets down below you and you start dragging it up towards you, you've got a very tight line. If you get a strike in that position, you're liable to break off. So I hold the line very loosely under my index finger, and I hold it loosely in my stripping hand, so if I do get a strike, I can actually give with a strike, and I won't break off. So just to review, straight line cast, line over the finger, strip, rotate downstream, trying to keep that line perpendicular to the currents. Cover as much water as you can. The basic streamer technique. It helps to be a long liner when fishing streamers. Otherwise, it's over too quickly. The object is to cover a maximum amount of water. This is the most athletic form of fly fishing. It's also the most consistent way to catch the big fish. There we go. Hey, he took that little streamer. Oh, 
Now, when you fish a streamer, you can pull it across those currents and cover so much more water than a dry fly. So on the days when they're, they're up for streamers, it's a quick way to catch fish. Sometimes you even get some of your biggest fish of the year on the old streamer. <clears throat> it takes a lot of hard work. It's long casting and a lot of stripping. But it can sure be worthwhile. There's a nice brownie. Took that old Matuka. Yeah, I love it. <clears throat> the tails of these pools are the, probably the best spot to throw the streamers. And it takes forever to fish them with a dry fly. <clears throat> with a streamer, you can cover the water so much quicker. Okay, we'll take up the excess here. If you're gonna be good at the streamers, work on your long straight line cast and improve your stripping ability. There's a little exercise that you can do. I think a practice it'll just lay the fly line out and try to strip the whole thing in about 10 or 12 seconds. If you can't do that, you're really probably not ready for some heavy duty streamer fishing. Ah, let's see if we can get this guy in here. Boy, he sucked up that matuka. Ah. Love this brown matuka in this kind of water, especially when it's just a little bit off color. Oh yeah, nice brown trout. Brown trout took a brown matuka. Oh boy, he really chomped on it right in that lower jaw. Yeah. Beautiful fish, beautiful fish. Okay, fella. You deserve a release after that. <laughs> there he goes. As you can see, streamer fishing can be very rewarding. To be effective, learn to throw a long straight line cast and practice stripping so you can make your fly pulsate across the currents at varying speeds. So far, all of our non-hatch fishing has been done with subsurface flies and techniques. First, we drifted them naturally along the bottom using nymphs and wet flies. Then I taught you how to fish streamers, where we strip them actively across the varying currents. In both situations, we use the basic straight line cast, the control system, and stripping. Now we're going up on top and fish dry fly attractors, which are usually rather large gaudy patterns that represent a yummy morsel to the trout. This might be the most enjoyable form of fly fishing because everything is so visual. I use a bright colored floating line. The flies are large and easy to see. The strike comes at the surface and is oftentimes explosive. Everything is laid out in living panorama right in front of you. When you're fishing dry fly attractors, you're not into the master chess game of matching the hatch. The fish are usually not selective about having the exact perfect pattern thrown at them. Your two basic problems, other than deciding which attractor pattern to use, are reading the water or trying to pick the best spot where you think you'll have the highest probability of getting a strike, and then making the right presentation to get the best float. Good places to fish with attractor patterns include seams, where currents of varying speeds come together, and places where shallow drops quickly to deep water or where light turns to dark. These are ambush points or lazy Susan setups where food drifts by conveyor belt fashion. After you've picked what you think is the right spot, then you must select a fly. Here are some of my favorite attractors. The ugly rudimus, a brown by visible, or hair wing flies like the royal wolf or the goofus bug. Now that you've selected a fly, you must decide which presentation is best. If you've mastered the fishing the clock techniques I showed you in advanced fly casting, you're all set. Let's see if we can attract a fish out of this pool. For a fly, I'm going to use this size 8 Madam X, which has become my very favorite dry fly for searching the water. There's something about those round rubber legs tied in that X position that really turn fish on. I'm using about 12 foot of leader tapered down to 3X. I'll put floating on the fly and also on the leader. 
especially for this type of fishing, everything should float as high as possible. A high floating fly cannot be examined as well as a low floater. It also looks more alive on the water. Okay, this is a great looking pool. We're gonna cover it with some dry fly tractors up on top. I got old Adam X tied on here. Now, out in the middle, I see some good cover, but probably the best stuff's over on the far side. So we'll take a couple of sh short casts first. We don't wanna throw over some good fish. Make sure we fan our way across. Now the next cast, we'll go over a little further, out into the center of the current. Good old control system, line over the finger, go with the flow. Okay. Now, we'll try the far side of that tongue, and just as I suspected, I got a faster current between me and my fly. It's coming from the left, so that means an upstream reach, kind of like that. Now my fly should stay in there longer, longer. Okay, keep that system fairly tight. Go with the flow. Now, you can bet your bottom dollar those, the best fish are probably in the toughest place to cast. So I'm gonna drill a couple back in there, over near those flowers. I think you can see how slow that fly's moving and how fast the fly line's going. Fish it way down now. Gonna throw one even further. Nice tight loop, way back under the overhanging branches. And this time I'm even gonna put a curve on it, see if I can stay over there longer. Kinda like that. Now, a little trick is when that line starts to bow, just pick your rod tip up and then drop it quickly and you've straightened the system and you're off on another float. You can do that a number of times on one float down through a pool and you cover different segments of the pool. Well, now we'll try to get one real close to that bush over there. Looks like there's good overhead cover. Yep, threw a little too far. Let's go back in with it. There, we bounce it right under, right under. Come on, got to be something in that nice looking spot. Good cover. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mmm, yeah. Oh, Madam X does it again. Nice fish. Nice fish. Can't, uh, can't leave that wiggly round rubber alone. Now, this guy might not make it. Oh, yeah. Little jump job there. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Do it again. Do it again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty. Like a little tarpon. Silver dynamo. Oh, look at that stripe. Good old bow. Okay. Oh, we're going to have more trouble if he gets down below. Bigger fish. Try to keep them up if you can. Keep their head up, but if they make a run, just plant the rod. Let them have their way. Usually get them back. Get too low here. Just rotate the body like this. And bring that rod tip around upstream. Get him upstream. A lot of you. Ah, there we go. Dry fly attractor fishing is not only super effective for catching fish when the water appears to be dead, but it is also an excellent method of taking inventory. Some days, almost all of the fish will hit short. But if you carefully catalog each strike and come back later, you can take these fish with a smaller, more realistic fly. To be successful at this type of fishing, you must learn to read the water well and practice until you've mastered fishing the clock. The bulk of our fishing in a trout stream is based on imitating the critters that are born and bred in the stream itself, mainly aquatic insects or small fish. There are many occasions, however, when land-bred insects, like terrestrials, find their way into the water and create excellent fishing. Normally, they appear sporadically, just one here and one there. It is during periods when the water is basically dead that terrestrial fishing can salvage your day. 
It seems that insects such as ants, crickets, beetles, and hoppers are special delicacies to the trout. They rarely let one pass by. They must taste good to the trout like hot fudge sundaes do to me. One of the very best terrestrial fishermen I know is Barry Beck. During the dead periods of the day, Barry has the uncanny ability of being able to move fish, sometimes quite large ones, with terrestrial patterns. He's especially adept using crickets and hoppers. Here's Barry to show you how he does it. The months of July and August provide some of the best terrestrial fishing of the season. The hot afternoon temperatures get the terrestrial insects moving, and basically, for the most part, our major mayfly hatches are just about over. The Latorte hopper and the Latorte cricket are two of my favorite terrestrial patterns. Constructed of deer hair with fur bodies, they float well and are extremely durable. I like to use the Latorte hopper on meadow type streams. I find the Latorte cricket works better in situations like this. Basically, what we have here is a situation of deep undercut banks with those overhanging hemlock boughs. This provides good adequate cover, and the fish will lie tight back against those banks and feed on any terrestrial insects that fall off the bank of those tree limbs and float into their view. This is a super situation for a Latorte cricket. Let me show you how I do it. Hey, for most of my terrestrial fishing, I prefer rods of eight, eight and a half feet in length that handle a four or five weight line. Leaders, I like lengths of 14, 15 feet in length, tapered to 5x. Okay, we're going to use a cricket as a surge type pattern here. And we're going to just ease out here, and we're going to start with a short cast first and cover the water in front of us. Then we'll work it right back in underneath that hemlock bow and right on into the bank. The thing you want to look for here is to have a good presentation, good drag free float. When we get underneath that hemlock bow, we'll have to use a good tight loop to punch that fly back in underneath the bank. Follow the fly. Concentration is very important. That cricket has a low profile. Keep your eye on that spot. Follow the fly. Get a little bit of that to drift. Just reach out. There we had a fish look. I'll we'll give him the fly one more time. See if he'll look at it again. You've got to watch where the cricket enters the water. Fall through. Okay, let's extend our cast back underneath that hemlock right there. Basically just covering the water, searching out any likely looking spot that fish might be lying in. Two major things to remember. Number one, watch where that fly hits the water. That's important. It's very, very easy to lose a fly. Number two, make sure it's floating without drag. Accuracy is very, very important fishing tight against the bank. You've got to pop that fly right in there. You've only got a few feet to get the fly in. Let's take one and go right back tight against the bank, see if we can find a bank feeder back there that might be interested in our cricket. All right, that fish was really tight. Just keep some pressure on them, keep them now away from that bank. We're gonna be a little patient with this fish. We're fishing six X here. Just keep some pressure on them. You really have to be observant when you're fishing these undercut banks and these debris piles and, and the like. Sometimes those fish will just stick their nose out and sip in your cricket. You've got to really be on the ball. Okay, I think we're getting this all beat. Strong fish. Most of these fish that we've had today are really putting a tug on that rod. Shaking his head a little bit here. We'll just ease him over and get him into the net. Get his head up close. Nice brown trout. Nice orange adipose spin. Very well conditioned, well colored. Handsome fish. A little bit of a hook there on the end of the jaw. Okay, we've unhooked this cricket. Now we're just going to gently release him back in the water. There we go. We'll take a look and see if we can find another one here along this bank. 
All the techniques we've shown you so far in this tape are very important for you to learn because in most streams, you spend the greatest share of your time each day fishing water that is basically dead. So you must develop the ability to pick out the best spots and then make the proper presentation cast to each spot. Now let's talk about fishing to rising trout. On the average trout stream, there's a relatively short period every day when the fish are actively feeding on the surface. There are exceptions. Occasionally you hit one of those incredible days when the fish are up and on the job all day long. These days are rare. Over the entire season, I'll encounter such experiences only five or six times. And it's possible, but rare, that a day will come along where there's no surface feeding at all. But by and large, you can be assured that fish will take food off the top for a one to two hour period every day. The trick, of course, is to determine when you should be on the stream to take advantage of these situations. Here's a pretty good rule to follow. It's called the pleasant time of day theory. The best time for the hatch is that period during the day when the weather is most pleasant to you. Here's how it works. During the early season, when the weather is typically cold, the most pleasant time of day is midday. During the summer, the most pleasant time is early and late. The exception would be a rainy, cloudy day. On these occasions, the most pleasant time is all day, and that's when the flies hatch, all day long. During the late season, you're back to midday. This general rule is extremely accurate. Of course, it's great if you can be on the river all day, but if you can only get out for a couple of hours, you might as well be there when the fish are up and feeding. These hatch periods can be both easy and difficult. Easy because the fish show you exactly where they are. They are up, they're gorging, and they're in the mood. Difficult because they quickly become very selective. After they've taken a few naturals, they know exactly what fly they want and how it should be acting on the water. During a hatch, the angler's faced with two problems. Selecting a fly that resembles a natural's close enough to trigger the feeding reflex of the trout, and presenting that fly in a natural manner, which is usually, but not always, drag-free. Drag, of course, is a perplexing problem that confronts the dry fly fisherman. But if you've mastered the techniques covered in our advanced casting tape, drag will not be the problem it once was. Now, let's talk about selecting the right fly. Don't keep trying pattern after pattern just because you like the looks of them. Your chance of coming up with the right fly using this random selection method is probably less than 100 to 1. When you consider the time factor, this is compounded even more. If the hatch is short-lived, you simply don't have enough time to try many flies. Now I'll show you the right way to select the right fly. Find out what's on the water. This is imperative. First, get the rod out of your hands. Either go over and lay it on the bank or attach it to your vest. Then use a net or a seine like this one, a goldfish net will do, and scoop up some of the drifting naturals. You must get them in your hand or net so you can observe them closely. Observation of insects flying overhead or floating by your rod tip simply won't do. Only when they're in your hand can you accurately tell what size, shape, and color they are. These are the criteria for selecting the right fly. Size, shape, and color in that order. Size is the most important factor when it comes to matching the hatch. After a fish has taken a few naturals, he knows exactly what size they are and becomes very selective. Most anglers have a tendency to fish flies that are larger than the naturals because bigger flies are easier to see. Worry more about getting the size right than seeing your fly. If the natural has an upright opaque wing, like a mayfly done, so should your artificial. 
If it has translucent wings laid flat, then your artificial should too. Color is the least critical of the three factors, but sometimes can be very important. Get the general color right if you can, but don't worry about having the exact shade. If you must decide between a light and a dark fly, pick the darker one. Remember, in order to be accurate in matching size, shape, and color, you must catch the natural. Get one at all costs. Even if you have to walk over into the line of drift where the fish are feeding, go ahead and put them down. They'll be up again. The only difficult part is putting the rod down for a few minutes. It is not necessary to know the scientific names of all the critters that you'll find on the surface of a trout stream, but you should at least be able to identify the four major insect types and select flies to match them. Mayfly duns have upright, opaque wings. They look like sailboats on the water and fly very gracefully. Standard dun imitations have hackle and wings made from various feathers. These flies work best on broken water when there is a hatch of natural duns. They also work well when the naturals are skittering and moving over the surface of the water. The hackle fibers give the illusion of a moving insect. There's a special imitation called the no-hackle dun, which works best on selective trout that are feeding in smooth, placid water. Mayfly spinners have clear wings, and sometimes their body coloration is quite different from the dun. They fly with an erratic, dipping, rising motion. Standard spinner patterns have hackle and flat or airplane style wings. Special no hackle spinners are used when the fish have become super selective during a fall of natural spinners. Stonefly adults have two pair of wings flat over their back and are very clumsy flyers. Adult stonefly imitations normally have hair wings and should be used during a hatch and also during the egg laying process. Caddisfly adults have hairy, tent-like wings, no tails, and fly like moths. Adult caddisfly imitations often have palmer hackle bodies, which keep the fly high up on the water for better flotation and easier skittering. These imitations can be used during the hatch and egg laying periods. Midge adults are very small with short wings and no tails. Most adult midge patterns are tiny hackle flies, usually size 20 to 24, which are at their best when the naturals are moving over the surface of the water. Now that you have a good idea of how to select the right fly for rising trout, you must be able to present it in a natural manner. No matter how realistic your pattern, if you can't cast it to the right spot, and if you can't make it act like the naturals, you will not hook many fish, especially the larger ones. Drag is the downfall of most dry fly fishermen. Now it works to your advantage by creating lies that are difficult to get a good drift to. These difficult spots provide ideal protection for a big trout from all but a few anglers like yourself. So let me apply what you learn in our advanced fly casting tape to some actual dry fly situations. The techniques I'll be using work well, not only for standard dries, but also for the special dry flies that match the hatch. This is really a great spot for fishing straight upstream to the 12 o'clock position. Actually, you don't have much choice in the matter. It's too tight to fish to either bank. If you fish downstream, you'll probably spook the trout. So let's fish straight upstream. Remember that slow profile, straight line casting, followed by stripping. Now, in this kind of fast water, you've really got to strip fast. Now, if you have trouble with the stripping and you can't keep up, then use your roll pickup. Take that slack out by rolling it out, immediately false cast, and go back to target. Other than that, it's conventional pickup, low cast over the water, line over the finger, and stripping. The hard thing now in this fast water is to keep up with the stripping. 
Okay, there we go. Hey, little guy in the run. You betcha. Oh, oh, oh. Now, the neat thing about getting them upstream like this, there's a hooking angle. Boy, that old hook's coming right down her throat. Oh, pretty little brownie. Pretty little brownie. Yeah, yeah. Hey, <laughs> he's still hot. Okay, don't want to rush it, pal. Now, in this fast current, you've really got to get their head up, kind of water ski them over. You don't want to go too light with your tippet for this deal. Now, let's see. How did he take it? Oh, he took it pretty deep. There we go. Yeah, nice and fit. Hey, it's all right. It's all right. Make sure he's in good shape before you let him go in that kind of a current. All right. Here's a great spot to fish the 3 o'clock position. <clears throat> You'll recall from our... Uh, advanced casting tape that the best combination here was a reach across the body followed by the control system. You may also recall that if you threw a straight line across that you get drag almost immediately. The line is dragging the fly across the currents. And even with slack line you get a little bit better float but it doesn't take long until that line gets ahead of the fly and drags it. So the very best cast for this position is where you reach across your body and follow it up with a control system. A little tip, have as much attention on the line under your rod tip as you do in the fly. That's more important to keep that system right than to worry about the fly. Nice reach across here, control system. This time I'll use a roll pickup, cross body reach, and control system. I think this is truly my favorite position of all in fishing, is to fish the three o'clock position. <clears throat> Remember to keep your eye on that rod tip, keep that system nice and straight. <clears throat> you know, the neat thing about the reach to the left bank, and I guess the reason I like it so well, it gives her, oh, hey, yes, my golly. Don't worry about talking about the reach cast, and I got a fish. Boy, that guy liked the reach cast, I'll tell you that. Oh, he really loves it. Of course, he's no longer in 3 o'clock, he's almost down to 6 o'clock. <clears throat> yeah, maybe we get him back up here. Son of a gun. But what I was saying about that reach, you get that fly coming in well before the leader line, you get a great presentation angle. Oh, this guy has uh, been eating his Wheaties. Strong guy. Strong guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, nice brownie. Nice brownie. Love it. Okay, are you still too hot or not? Oh, yeah, 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 not bad. Mm. Well, the old reach cast scores again. Well, the tail end of this run looks like a great place to fish straight downstream to the 6 o'clock position. Let's give it a try. <clears throat> Remember, when you fish straight downstream, you throw a lot of slack line. You throw the loop high, you drop the rod tip, now, to extend the float, you add your feeding, where you pop the rod like this. Let's throw that again. Aim your loop high, drop the rod, and then feed. Try to get it down there over one of those trout. Nice drag-free float. Now, if you think you do have a good trout down there and you don't want to spook him with a line, then add the reach cast to your slack. Angle your rod off to the side and then after the cast is on the water, bounce a rod, feed it down. But basically, to fish downstream like this, slack line followed by feeding. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, nice fish, nice fish. Okay. The old downstream slack line cast, yeah. With a current moving from right to left in this run, and with that super cover straight across to the other bank, we have a great setup for fishing the 9 o'clock position. Now, let's fish it. <clears throat> One of the basic casts that you'd use for that position would be your reach cast, where you reach up to the right. But you might want to try the hook cast, or where you curve it to your left, or combine the two, the reach and the curve, something like that. But you've got to use a cast to keep that line well up to your right to get a good float. Okay, let's try another cast right over there in front of those nice overhanging bushes. Good looking spot to me. I'll go with the flow. Nice long drift. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, he took that reach cast. Okay, I don't know, he feels pretty good. Good, I better get on this reel, I'm gonna have trouble here. Okay, mm, feels like a good fish. He doesn't seem to be jumping. Mm. Hanging right under that cover. Those are the kind of places where you want to get your fly. You can bet your bippy that if it's a tough place to cast, that's where you're going to find a good fish like this one. This is a good fish. Nice brown trout. Okay. You're just hanging back under that cover. If I'd have gone in there with the old straight line cast, I'd have been dragging in about a microsecond. And... Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. Just a little hot, eh? Mm. Took it kind of deep. Oh no, we got her out. We got her out. Oh, pretty fish. Pretty fish, yeah. Okay. I was gonna say go back and grow up, but you don't have to. Nice, nice trout. Once you've mastered fishing the clock, you'll be able to present your dry fly effectively at every angle. You'll be able to cope with situations that you once thought insurmountable. You'll be able to handle them when others can. Earlier in this tape, you learned how to fish nymphs deep along the bottom. And I just finished showing you how to present dry flies in a drag-free manner. One important stage of the mayfly life cycle that I haven't shown you how to fish is the wet emerger. Wet emergers imitate the emerging mayfly as it is transforming from the nymph to the adult dun. While the dun is breaking out of the nymphal shuck, it is very vulnerable, an easy meal for the trout. In most species, the transformation from nymph to dun takes place somewhere between the stream bottom and the water surface. During the hatching process, the wings of the dun pop out of the nymphal skin first. To imitate this stage, there are two basic patterns. The hen emerger is an excellent realistic imitation which has hen hackle tips slanted back over the body. The soft tackle fly, which is simply a fur body with a partridge collar, is a more impressionistic type pattern. Now, let me show you how to fish the wet emergers. The wet emerger can be a deadly fly during the entire hatch, but the very best time to use it is just before the hatch starts and right up to the time where you first start seeing fish rising. Where I like to position myself is just across and above the fish. If I see fish flashing or swirling over here, I get slightly above them, a little ways over from the current that they're in. Now, here's the way I fish the emerger. I basically make a straight line cast, 45 degrees upstream. I put the line over the finger. I follow down, take in the slack. I keep the pressure off that emerger so it'll sink as deep as I can get it. When I think it's coming up on the fish, I raise my rod and I swim it right up in front of them. Let's do that again. Straight line cast, 45 degrees upstream, line over the finger, take in the slack, be alert to that bright colored fly line. You might get the strike upstream, but here's the hot spot, just below your body position. This time I'll just kind of twitch that fly up, swim it in front of those fish. Now notice I hold the line very loosely in my hands because it's usually a tight line strike. You hold the line tight, you will break off. If I want to fish to fish that are further out in the river or I have very deep water, I may do a little bit of mending. I'll make the cast, I'll mend some line upstream, put the line over my finger, take in the slack, I watch the end of that bright line, let that emerger get good and deep in the current. Now I'll rise it in front of those fish with a little twitching motion, hold the line loose, and you usually get your strike right down in here. Let me fish the wet emerger down through this run. I'll cast it across. Now I lower the rod and follow. Keep the pressure off of it. Watch that orange line. I want to feed it down a little further because those fish are quite a ways down. I want to get that fly in the bottom and try to raise it up. Oh, hey, okay. He took, oh, you got to watch those tight line strikes. That's pretty good fish. 
So we can get him on the reel. Okay. All right, nice little rainbow. Boy, he likes that emerger, I'll tell you. Yeah, nice pretty red stripe. Nice pretty red stripe. Nice fish, nice fish. Because this past water makes him even nicer. He's a fatty. Oh, he's been eating well. He's been eating more than emergers. Oh, fat fish. Fat fish. Oh, yeah. Pretty fish. Pretty rainbow. Oh, yeah. yeah. Holy smokes. Now, put that old wet emerger right in the corner of the, of the lip there. Get that out. Oh, pretty fish. Took that old wet emerger, you son of a gun. There we go. All right. In this tape, I've coupled the thought process with the physical skills necessary to make you a successful fly fisherman. To get that extra mile of drag-free float each day, you must improve your efficiency by learning to select the right fly quickly, reduce false casting to a minimum, improve your accuracy, and select the proper presentation cast for each situation. For non-hatch conditions, I showed you how to read the water and then how to search the water fishing with nymphs, streamers, attractor dry flies, and terrestrials. For those magical moments when the fish are rising, you learn to select the right pattern and choose the right presentation. And finally, I showed you how to fish the wet emergers. Now you have a complete formula for success. You should have the ability to take selective trout from places where others can't even cast to. Join me in my advanced strategy tape, and I'll show you how to become the best fly fisherman you can possibly be. excitement you're after. Come fishing with the experts from 3M Scientific Anglers and learn ways to catch more and bigger trout on the fly. You'll learn where to find trout in a stream and ways to present the right fly with the perfect cast so you can catch the most elusive trout during hatch and non-hatch situations. Plus there's steel heading for 20 pound rainbows or going for the ultimate saltwater challenge. Let 3M Scientific Anglers bring home the excitement while you learn a lifetime of mastery techniques that will help you become the best fly fisherman you can be. There's no other sport like fly fishing. It can truly give you a lifetime of discovery and enjoyment. Whether you fish your own favorite stream, or travel the world with your fly rod, there's no end to what you'll learn. To help speed you along your path of discovery, Scientific Anglers from 3M has recruited some of the world's best fly fishermen to produce a complete learning system of videotape programs. 
Unlike simple how-to videos, the Scientific Angler's Mastery Series shows you more than just tips. It gives you an easy-to-learn formula for success to truly help you become a master angler. There are programs designed to give you a strong foundation of knowledge and skill. At the next level, the mastery system helps you integrate the skills and knowledge into sophisticated fly fishing strategies. And for the expert, there are challenge level programs that offer original and innovative techniques to help you master the most difficult fly fishing situation. Think of it as a learning path towards fly fishing mastery. The tape you just viewed is part of that path. In Doug Swisher's Trout Series, Scientific Anglers presents a four-part program that features a natural learning progression. First, there's basic fly casting, where you learn loop control and the principles of throwing a perfect straight line cast. Then you move on to advanced fly casting, building your skills with more complex casting techniques, including curve and reach casts. Now you're ready for action as Strategies for Selective Trout shows you how to fish a hatch from bottom to top. And you'll almost feel the strike as Doug demonstrates ways to take difficult trout in non-hatch conditions. Finally, in Advanced Strategies for Selective Trout, Doug teaches you his most sophisticated methods, including ways to successfully fish the midge, how to unlock the mysteries of masking hatches and special streamer tactics to catch big trout. You'll be part of the action as you look through the eyes of the expert and learn the real whys behind the mastery of fly fishing for trout. While you're improving your streamside skills, you may also want to learn to tie your own flies. Gary Borger shows you a step-by-step -step approach to the basics of fly tying. And Doug Swisher demonstrates how to tie flies to match the hatch and his deadly attractor patterns. If you're hooked on catching the big ones, you've got to see the four-part series on fly fishing for Pacific Steelhead. Lonnie Waller and Jim Teeny will provide you with a complete arsenal of skills so that you can take these giant rainbows, even in the most challenging conditions. But that's not all. Scientific Anglers takes you south to watch world record holder Billy Pate demonstrate his secrets of success for hooking up and landing the ultimate fly fishing game. And if you love fishing, hunting, and other sports, think of 3M as your total video resource for outdoor adventure. Explosive action. In-depth information. Incredible scenes. 3M Sportsman's Video Collection brings you the world of bass fishing with America's top anglers like Doug Hannon, Ricky Klein, and Al Linder, a comprehensive learning series that'll make you the best bass angler on your lake. You'll be glad you watch these programs when you catch the bass of a lifetime. the gentle beauty of a deep forest glade, the heart-pounding excitement of a trophy buck in rut, going one-on-one -on -one with North America's most popular big game animal. That's what deer hunting's all about. And nobody brings you more in-depth information and true life action than the 3M Sportsman's Video Collection. The excitement of calling a bird into your gun. The satisfaction of making a clean shot. And the companionship of a well-trained dog. If you like the challenge of upland game bird and waterfowl hunting, 3M Sportsman's video collection gives you the thrill of being there. And the knowledge you need to master the sport. If you're serious about having fun on the slopes, then the video series Skiing with Style is just for you. 3M got together with Skiing Magazine and the Professional Ski Instructors of America to bring you a unique, proven training method 
that will help you learn more advanced techniques faster than you ever thought possible. You'll feel like you're skiing right along with the pros as you build your confidence and learn new skills that can make the entire mountain your playground. Be sure to see the Skiing with Style series from 3M. And you'll be looking good out on the slopes.